Hi, I'm Loretta Nostville from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. And this week I presented at the SOHO 2020 meeting, Chemotherapy Free Options for Lymphoma. It's a very broad topic, so I was somewhat intimidated with that topic, but there are some pertinent new FDA approvals in the US that are noteworthy that are not chemotherapy-based approaches. And my general sense is that as we move more and more into targeted therapy, uh, chemotherapy will be something that will be less and less developed in our new drugs and our new indications. So I started the talk with follicular lymphoma. It is our most common endo lymphoma, which is generally uh, viewed as being highly responsive to initial therapies that's oftentimes coupled with re current relapse. And generally those remission durations become shorter and shorter. And at least a quarter to a half of patients will ultimately succumb to their disease or transformation of their disease to large cell lymphoma. The current expected life uh, expectancy for these patients is at least 20 plus years. And so I view this in my own practice as more of a marathon than a sprint. And so my goals of therapy are to provide meaningful and durable remission. So that will provide patients treatment free intervals, ideally that last for years, but that has to be married with um, therapy that is well tolerated and will not have a detrimental impact on quality of life. And even more importantly, will not put them at risk for second cancers that may ultimately shorten their life. And that is my opinion why some of these targeted therapies have become more and more attractive for patients with endolent lymphoma, recognizing that they will have multiple treatment courses over the course of their disease. For frontline, chemotherapy still has a mainstay across most countries for the management of flick lymphoma, but it is worth noting the relevant study, which was a randomized head-to-head -head comparison of rituximab in combination with chemotherapy versus lenalidomide, which is an oral immune modulator, uh, it, which based off of phase two studies was associated with very high response rates when coupled with rituximab uh, and meaningful duration of response in frontline follicular lymphoma, which set the stage for the randomized phase three study. This trial enrolled those that were in need of therapy based off of GELF criteria. Uh, what was different about the phase three study in comparison to the phase two studies was there was a longer duration of the doublet of lenalidomide and rituximab. So after a six month induction, uh, patients that were responding were then continued on maintenance with the doublet for 18 cycles, and these were 28 day cycles, and then an additional uh, 12 uh, months of rituximab monotherapy. So a total duration of 30 months months, which was designed to match the control arm of six months of induction chemotherapy, either bendamustine, CHOP, or CVB, when combined with rituximab, followed by two years of maintenance rituximab. The study was technically negative, meaning the lenalidomide and rituximab arm was not an improvement uh, over the rituximab and chemo arm uh, in regards to progression-free survival at about three and a half years of median follow-up or the complete response rate at 120 weeks or 30 months of treatment. Uh, nonetheless, when you look at the efficacy seen in the lenalidomide and rituximab arm, it was quite favorable with high response rates uh, and quite durable progression-free survival at the cutoff. Uh, and the safety profile also looked to be quite promising uh, with less neutropenia, less febrile neutropenia in the lenalidomide and rituximab arm, uh, albeit higher rates of rash, which was generally seen in the first cycle. Uh, as Result uh, in the US, lenalidomide rituximab is a chemotherapy free option for untreated patients based off of the NCCN guidelines. Uh, and I recognize that is not true for other countries. In the relapse setting, lenalidomide rituximab has a foothold likely in second line or later based off of the augment data, which demonstrate a substantial improvement in progression free survival if you receive lenalidomide and rituximab over rituximab monotherapy. Uh, the duration of treatment and the dosing was different from what was uh, investigated in relevance and that patients received 12 cycles of lenalidomide, 20 milligrams uh, days one through 21. They received uh, rituximab four weekly doses during the first cycle um, and then at the beginning of the cycle for the first um, six cycles and then it was discontinued thereafter. The median PFS by the Independent Review Committee was 39 months, which was substantially longer than the 14 months seen in the rituximab control arm. Um, and though there was differences in the toxicity profile, uh, nothing that was unusual or not previously described with the combination. So as a result, 
Lenalidomide rituximab is a non-chemotherapy option for patients with relapsed follicular or marginal zone lymphoma based off of the study population uh, in the U.S. and is now being approved in uh, other countries as well. Most recent to the scene in relapsed follicular lymphoma was tazimetastat, which is an EZH2 inhibitor. It's an oral therapy that's taken 800 milligrams twice daily until progression or intolerance. So it's potentially a, a disadvantage over the R squared combination with the fixed duration of treatment that this is continuous. Um, based off of a single arm phase two study, response rates were quite high, though higher in those patients who had an EZH2 mutation than those that were wild type. And in follicular lymphoma, it's projected that 10 to maybe as high as 30% of patients will have an EZH2 mutation. But there was also meaningful progression-free survival seen in the wild type population. So 11 months versus about 14 months if you had the mutation. So as a result, tazimetastat is now FDA approved in the US for patients with follicular lymphoma with the mutation who've had at least two lines of therapy. But even for patients with wild type, or if you don't know the mutation status, if they don't have a reasonable alternative standard of care option, it's now an oral non-chemotherapy-based approach uh, for those patients. The toxicity profile is what probably stands out the most about tazimetastat with very few, if any, grade three or higher toxicity observed with this continuous therapy. There are still PI3 kinase inhibitors in the relapsed follicular lymphoma space, uh, but nothing new. Uh, recently, though, we're anticipating more information about umbralisib, which is a PI3 kinase delta uh, inhibitor. Uh, that has been reported out in marginal zone lymphoma, and we know that the results of the follicular uh, cohort um, also appear promising. So stay tuned for that. In large cell lymphoma, most recently, we've had uh, rapid expansion of the treatment options in the relapse setting, uh, but most recent has been the approval of tafacitumab, which is a naked CD19 antibody. I mean, it is not a CAR, it's not an antibody drug conjugate, but an antibody that has been glycoengineered for enhanced ADCC. And the results of the L-MIND study in which tafacitumab was combined with lenalidomide in patients with relapsed or refractory large cell lymphoma uh, demonstrated very impressive response rates, but even more importantly, impressive progression-free survival and overall survival uh, in this population that up until recent had been facing very dismal outcomes if they'd failed frontline or later lines of therapy. It's notable that the population for L-MIND uh, was directed at patients that were not transplant candidates, either as a result of age or comorbidities or even patient preference. Uh, so most of the patients in the L-MIND study were in their 70s um, and deemed inappropriate for transplant based off of age, which is somewhat controversial, particularly in the U.S., they also excluded patients with primary refractory disease, um, and they restricted it to patients with one or th up to three lines of prior therapy. So this was a less heavily pretreated patient populations than um, other studies that have been conducted in this space, but it does now uh, provide a non-chemotherapy, non-CAR T-cell therapy approach for patients with relapsed large cell lymphoma who've had at least prior one line of therapy and not eligible for stem cell transplant. This now creates uh, dis debates in terms of what's the preferred treatment approach for relapsed large cell lymphoma currently, uh, and without randomized head-to-head -head comparisons, there will likely be uh, opinions that will drive those decisions in regional variances. Uh, but the important thing about having options for patients, including things like tafacitumab, is these are therapies that can be administered locally through their community oncologist, which may spare them the need to travel to referral centers. Um, the other thing I will note, though, is that for tafacitumab, the treatment with the naked antibody is ongoing beyond the 12 cycle combination with lenalidomide, and it's continued until progression or intolerance with dosing every two weeks. So that is something to also acknowledge and recognize that that may become cumbersome for patients over time. So that was my very brief summary of my 10-minute discussion of chemotherapy-free options for lymphoma patients based off of new approvals just in the last year or so. Uh, but as I do this each year, the amount of new drug approvals for lymphoma is quite impressive to me, and we look forward to the next year with additional agents such as CAR T-cell therapy with new indications, uh, as well as bispecific antibodies that are anticipated uh, to continue to burden us with treatment selection choices. I appreciate your interest in time today.